Hi, uh, good evening everyone, I think we'll make a start. So, um, welcome to the Science Public Lecture Series. Uh, I am Hilary Collins and I co-organise the event with colleagues in physics and the Institute of Policy and Engagement, Health with Advertising. If you want to be added to, these events happen once a month, so if you want to be added to the mailing list, um, the details are on the flyers. Um, we have um, the webpage from the physics department posts um, details about the series. I'm very happy to uh, welcome tonight uh, Dr. Phillips Jones, and she's going to talk to us about humankind versus microbes and who's winning the war of antimicrobial resistance. Well, thanks very much, uh, Hilary, for that lovely introduction, and lovely to see so many of you here, especially as we have such rotten weather outside. So, um, as Hilary has um, uh, mentioned, the title of this lecture tonight is about the war that is going on between humankind and infectious microbes in terms of antimicrobial resistance. Um, I thought before I got into that though that I should say one or two words about me and where I've come from. Um, so um, I um, have been a microbial physiologist for um, about, I uh, hate to admit it, almost 40 years now. And I work at the NCMH um, on antimicrobial resistance um, issues. And uh, in, for those who don't know where the Sutton Bonington campus is, where NCMH is located, it's about 10 miles away from here towards Loughborough. Um, it houses the vet school, the university farm, uh, and uh, other uh, associated um, uh, units. Uh, to deliver mostly the, uh, or at least in part, the agricultural subjects of the university. So why uh, are we at Sutton Bonington concerned with antimicrobial resistance? Uh, why are we doing research on that there? Well, of course, animals like us uh, are prone to infectious diseases. So it's important to be able to treat them with antibiotics as well as us. So uh, we are concerned tonight though with human uh, infections and antimicrobial resistance. And I'm sure that many of you here will have seen the publicity surrounding the problem of superbugs in hospitals. Uh, reported widely, especially recently and in recent years, superbugs arise because of antimicrobial resistance. And the Chief Medical Officer for England is uh, warning us uh, uh, that uh, something has to be done about the rise in antimicrobial resistances that we're seeing in our communities and in hospitals as well. So this is why the publicity is appearing, because there are lots of government documents driven by the Chief Medical Officer to alert us to the problem, and more importantly, to alert uh, pharmaceutical companies and government agencies that things have to be done. Okay, so let's have a look. What are these statistics that are appearing in the reports? Uh, just how serious a problem is it? Well, antimicrobial resistance kills 5,000 people in this country a year. It's not just a UK thing. It affects Europe, it affects the world. So, for example, in 15 uh, advanced European countries, up to 50% of the bloodstream infections that are due to an organism called Staphylococcus aureus are what is known as methicillin resistant. And methicillin resistance means multiple resistance to many of our antibiotics. And these are the MRSA superbugs, which cannot be treated with current therapies. 
And the CMO warns uh, that there is expected by 2050, if we don't do anything about it, that there could be up to 10 million deaths by then if we don't find some new antibiotics or some way around this problem. And this chart just summarizes that and shows uh, that people dying from AMR will well exceed those that die from cancer. It will take over from cancer. Okay, why are we losing this war of antimicrobial resistance? Antimicrobial resistance has always been around for a long time at very low levels and I suppose we didn't notice that because we had lots of antibiotics to overcome that problem. Let's have a look at what happened before antibiotics were around. So if we look at um, the top uh, reasons why people died in 1900, you see that in red the top ranking reasons are to do with microbes. Microbial diseases top the rankings in 1900. Whereas in our antibiotic era, most recent figures from the World Health Organization shows that as a result of antibiotic usage, these microbially driven diseases are much lower down the rankings now and that's due to antibiotics of course and antibiotics has indeed played its part in increasing our life expectancies as a result from 47 to 82 years many other factors as well but antibiotics have played their part in increasing our life expectancy and after all, we've come an awful long way from how diseases, microbial infections used to be treated in ancient civilizations in the past. There were natural remedies which worked to some extent. And we've come a long way, um, sort of moving into 19th century, still pre-antibiotic periods, uh, from the remedies that were available before antibiotics were on the scene. So this, these are excerpts from a book which is a family heirloom of mine from um, some farmers uh, who used to farm not far from here, the other side of Derby, uh, near Alfreton on the Wingfield Manor estate. And they kept a book of cures and remedies for themselves, for humans, which they called receipts for the human species, and they had another section for their animals. So let's just see what was available in those days for curing microbial infections. So for scarlet fever, which is caused by group A streptococci, strep pyogenes, the cure was I can hard, barely read that, but I've got a funny feeling. That is white spirit. So a little bit of white spirit, honey, and uh, sweet extracts of vitriol. That was sulfates. Um, all mixed together and given X number of days, uh, times per day. So that was the cure available for scarlet fever. Typhus fever. Oh, typhus fever caused by rickettsias is on similar lines. We've still got the white spirit, camphor, and nitrate extract to cure that. So obviously you can see how uh, ill-equipped people were in those times before antibiotics were available. They might alleviate the symptoms, but they're not going to cure the disease. They also had an animal section and I'll leave you uh, to uh, look at the recipe. <laughs> but I think this is Old English for enterococcal diarrhea. <laughs> so um, in this case, they had various things, currants and uh, peppers mixed into milk and thickened up with flour, and they would give that to the animal. So these are the sorts of cures that were available then. And we've even come a long way since 
uh, someone that's considered the father of antimicrobial chemotherapy. He started us on the right lines with antibiotics years ago. A very clever German microbiologist who noticed that the dyes and the stains that he was using in his microscopy were actually quite toxic to the bacteria he was trying to stain to look under the microscope. And he realized that you know, to cure diseases, could we have a magic bullet kind of uh, remedy? So he was the first person to suggest magic bullets targeting the infectious disease directly with something, some what he called magic bullet. And his first magic bullet actually wasn't all that successful, but it was used widely in the early 1900s, which was arsenic-based and obviously very toxic. Um, and uh, if it didn't kill you, then it might make you sterile as a consequence of taking it. But the right idea was there, that you target with some sort of molecule to kill infectious diseases off. GPs would say now that all these remedies that I've talked about, you know, at, at the end of the day, they're not curing it, and uh, survival is really as a result of the immune system overcoming the infection all by itself, and people recovered. So it's nothing to do with the arsenic, it's to do with the immune system overcoming the original infection. So that is what we may face again Okay, so to return to this question, why are we losing uh, the war of, of antimicrobial resistance now? Well, there are two main reasons why. And one of them is that we, mo we use far more antibiotics than we ever used to before. So this summary of what we used in the UK, just as a snapshot in 2017, shows you that we used... Uh, getting on for 500,000 kilograms and um, about half that amount in the agricultural sector, in the veterinary care sector as well. So what's the consequence of using more antibiotics? Well, this means that there is a tendency to find that they're actually not being used properly. And this is a predisposition to antimicrobial resistance. So, for example, GPs feel under pressure to prescribe something when we trot along and say, we've, well, we've got a sore throat and we really do expect some antibiotics to sort this out. The facts are that only 10% of sore throats are caused by bacteria, which antibiotics will work against. 90% of the time, it's a virus, which antibiotics don't work against anyway. So what happens is people take the antibiotics, they don't do any good, they're being used wastefully in other words, and those antibiotics end up passing through the patient's system, they end up in the environment. Similarly, sometimes antibiotics aren't taken as they're prescribed, people don't take them right to the end of the course. They end up with leftover antibiotics and perhaps flush them down the loo at the end, because there's nowhere else to take them. And in the veterinary sector, formerly, antibiotics have been used extensively as growth promoters. So there's nothing wrong with the animals, but they're given antibiotics so that they gain weight and they're worth more as a consequence to the agricultural sector. That doesn't happen now, as far as I'm aware, in the UK. So in all these cases, the antibiotics are entering the environment and they're not, it's not as if they're even doing a good job for us so it's a wasteful usage and these environmental antibiotics that escape interact with environmental microbes and when that happens um, they generate a resistance against these toxic antibiotics and uh, when they generate that resistance because they're exposed they pass that resistance on to all their relatives, which can be pathogenic organisms that cause us harm. 
So what kind of resistance will happen when a bacterium, shown here, is exposed to antibiotics? What resistance does it throw back at us? Well, it can form spontaneous mutations which mean that the antibiotic never gets into the cell at all, to the target that we want it to get at. So it mounts the resistance by preventing the antibiotic getting in through point mutation. Other mechanisms, they're wide ranging, is that if they acquire the genes, they can produce enzymes which degrade those antibiotics. And alternatively, they produce the, what's known as efflux pumps into their membranes in response. And these efflux pumps are made so that when the antibiotic just gets into the bacterium, it's immediately pumped back out again. So it never reaches the targets that they were aimed to inhibit. And so the bacterium survives and passes that information on, as I say, to its relatives and other species. And that, that is the consequence of environmental antibiotics. And that's how the resistance is generated. The other problem we face, the second reason we're facing this, is because no new classes of antibiotics have been discovered and implemented for, for us all since uh, 1987. This is the timeline of antibiotic discovery shown here, starting in 1928 with uh, penicillin over here. And as you can see, in recent times, we've got this big discovery void in terms of novel new antibiotics. So what happened following penicillin discovery is there followed a range of other antibiotics with time all the way through to here, where each of those antibiotics were very novel and very new in their structure and their class. And therefore, each time they were employed, when they first were introduced, they would have a dramatic effect on the bacteria because the bacteria had never experienced that antibiotic before. So this became the golden age of antibiotics because we were producing very chemically diverse, distinct antibiotics. But the writing was on the wall even in the 70s in that that um, source of novel classes started to dry up and people started to produce uh, antibiotics that were chemically similar to these ones back here. They did give a, a broadened microbial range largely through being able to get across the cell wall of the bacteria and they could address issues of antimicrobial resistance. But nonetheless, <coughs> these latter antibiotics are structurally related to the earlier ones. So they're not going to last as long because the bacteria have already experienced that type of molecule before. And so to the discovery void, of course, so no new antibiotics have appeared. OK. so. Perhaps to overcome this discovery void, it would be useful to look back whoops, at what precipitated this golden age of antibiotics over here, starting with penicillin. So what I'm going to do next is just run through the events and the uh, factors that made penicillin come, come to uh, be used for mass usage. So in the hope that perhaps lessons can be learnt from the discovery of penicillin for how we go forward and discover new antibiotics <coughs> henceforth. So the first thing to say is that the first antibiotic, penicillin, was born out of war. So World War II, of course, and many of us have learnt the story in school about Alexander Fleming discovering penicillin in 1928. So, as the famous story goes, he left a pile of Petri dishes on his work uh, bench, went away on holiday one August, and came back to find that one of his plates, Petri dishes, containing Staphylococcus aureus, this MRSA organism, 
containing Staph aureus was actually inhibited by a contaminant fungus that was growing on the plate. Something seemed to be diffusing <coughs> out from the fungus and creating a zone of protection for the fungus by inhibiting the growth of the Staphylococci colonies. And Fleming realized the importance of this discovery. He tried to extract the solution, the, the factor from inside the Petri dish to take it further, but he wasn't able to work a way of doing that. He did invite some industrialists over to take a look, but because it wasn't extracted, they lost interest. They said it was an interesting curiosity of science, but that was it. And so the story uh, starts to um, fade until the beginning of the Second World War, when Flory and Chain picked up this interesting observation again. But it wasn't until 16 years later that the antibiotic was developed. So that's one lesson to realize straight away is that it took time for penicillin to be recognized. So Flory and Chain uh, worked in Oxford to uh, find a way of getting the penicillin to come out of the fungus and into a solution so he could extract it. And with um, some help, they developed a sort of shake flask where the fungus is growing on the top and there's a liquid underneath where the penicillin can drop into. And then uh, once they'd done that, it could be scaled up for mass production. And that little slide just uh, tends to suggest that this was a very easy process. Oh yeah, once we've cracked that, then that'll be it. In fact, it was a lot more difficult than that. And what I'd like to run through on the next two slides is uh, what the process was in converting that observation of Fleming's into a reality of mass production of penicillin. So first of all, Flory recognized what a, a possibly miracle cure penicillin could be. And it was the start of the Second World War, and in order to protect as many troops as possible, um, he wanted to show that even if he could produce a few milligrams, that it works when you inject it into people, that it actually does work. He realized he would never get this off the ground unless he could show that. So that's what he set about doing in Oxford uh, initially. So these were the people involved. He got his wife over from Australia to come over and help and uh, girlfriends and microbiologists. So Norman Heatley actually developed suitable um, containers for culturing the fungus. Um, but they were short of containers at Oxford. It was a war, there was a war on, and they used any kind of dishes they could to cultivate the fungus for penicillin production. You name it, sheep dip cans, biscuit tins and bed pans. So they were at full stretch to find uh, suitable containers to produce enough of it. Uh, for the clinical trials and you may have heard of the penicillin girls their job was to to get enough penicillin extracted from those cultures and they were so short of penicillin to prove the clinical trials that they even recycled the unused penicillin from the urine of the patients that they were trialing and recycling it. And there's a story about one of the penicillin girls. She's got a big glass vase full of urine and she has to put this on the front of her bike and commenting that she just hopes she doesn't fall off on her way to extracting it. So they were uh, extremely stretched situation to produce enough to show that penicillin actually works. But they did. They did show that there was promise in it. And Flory realized he would have to go to the States to scale this up and persuade the Americans that this was good for their war effort as well. And 
This is a list of the people that were involved to making it happen. And I've, I've listed it because I want you to realise how many people were involved, how much effort it took to get this first antibiotic off the ground. So, um, 57 research contracts, 21 factories, and so on, 21 companies, five academic groups, and so on. And right at the centre of this, at the War Production Board, the director, Albert Elders, was central to imploring everyone involved on this list, you must um, exchange information freely, uh, forget about patent rights, exchange strains that you generate as well. All the information, please, please share it amongst everyone so that we can quickly deliver on penicillin. And that worked. And one of the reasons it worked, that everybody did collaborate, was because there were no patents for the penicillin process taken out. People took out patents on individual processes that they developed along the way, but they didn't patent the whole thing. And also, fortunately, Alexander Fleming didn't patent penicillin either. And that is what brought the companies in to being persuaded into penicillin development. Um, there were certain, there was all sorts of things that had to be done. The Justice Department had to exempt companies that were obtaining too much information because they could be taken to court for having too much information, known as the antitrust laws. So there was all sorts of agencies um, in the government and the military and pharmaceutical companies having to change their rules, if you like, to make penicillin happen. Okay, oh, uh, I meant to say, one of the first places the Oxford people went was here, the regional research labs. They had knowledge of how to scale up and grow fungi in large ferment fermentative tanks. So Flory wanted uh, this, this was what he wanted for his penicillin. Um, and the, uh, to just to illustrate, the other point I want to get across is how much they had to work on this penicillium notatum strain that Fleming discovered. So what they had to do was uh, refine the mould first. It wasn't producing enough penicillin. They switched from notatum to another one called penicillium chrysogenum, which was producing more penicillin, obviously. They sent it to Cold Spring Harbour to x-ray it uh, with the idea of mutating chrysogenum into producing more penicillin. They also sent it to uh, the University of Wisconsin to zap it with ultraviolet radiation, again to induce mutations which hopefully were beneficial for greater penicillin production. They developed new growth media all over again to cultivate these uh, refined moulds. And then they scaled it up to tanks. And at the end, this was the hub, this place was the hub for a thousand different strains that they generated, which they then disseminated to many pharma companies, governments and universities to keep, keep the wheels going. So, as I say, this is just to illustrate to you what a huge effort this was to, uh, to achieve the first antibiotic. <coughs> the US government also went into overdrive with publicity as well. So uh, this uh, eventually had the outcome that uh, many companies did get involved in the mass production uh, of penicillin. The point I'm making is that there was an urgency about producing this antibiotic that perhaps we don't have now. Okay, there was an urgency then. There were posters on the factory walls even saying, you know, give this everything <coughs> that you've got. And what they were leading up to was to have sufficient penicillin for D-Day, which was uh, June 6, 1945 for the big onslaught, um, uh, the Allied onslaught, onto reclaiming France. So, um, 
that's what they did. They uh, built up the reserves, they had enough by January 1945, and so they start disseminating penicillin to the public. They had enough, they had excess. And as you can see, the amounts are huge that they managed to develop in that short time, between 1941 and 1945. And it's estimated that they did, penicillin saved 12 to 15% of Allied forces' lives through um, fatal infections such as gangrene, wounds, and sepsis, and pneumonia. So mission partly accomplished, including um, uh, a dissemination of penicillin uh, uh, even to, to all sorts of places involved in the war. And this is my dad here, Jim Phillips, and he was stationed in Raniket Military Hospital in North India. He took this picture, I'm sure it's one which is just to send to the folks back home. I'm not sure that they actually conducted surgery out on the parade ground, so... <laughs> But, um, yeah, so it, it, it was a, a, a great thing to have penicillin available to treat the troops. Okay, so, uh, as said, 12 to 15% of Allied lives are estimated to be saved. But it doesn't just stop there, of course, does it? Because we all know that many lives since have been saved by penicillin, and it's estimated that maybe up to 200 million lives have been saved by penicillin. And this is just a picture of Flory, Chain, and Fleming receiving the Nobel Prize for what they did for World War II, anyway. Okay, and um, Shenley Labs, which were involved in producing penicillin, uh, wrote some nice words that, you know, not many good things come out of war, do they? But possibly uh, the best secret weapon that came out of World War II was a weapon that saves lives and not kills them. And penicillin did do that. Okay, so what lessons can we learn from penicillin coming back? So um, now we're in a state which is similar to what it was then, back in the 1940s. So... In both cases, in both time zones, there's recognised to be an increased need for antimicrobials. We know we need them. But we also know that there's a corporate reluctance as well. There is now, and there was then. Uh, and uh, similarly, we also have a concern, of course, uh, uh, about overwhelming infections, don't we, in this current time. Now, um, the corporations not getting involved, the pharma companies, uh, they were reluctant then, but they are reluctant now. We have already picked, perhaps, the low-hanging fruit, you could say. All these antibiotics that were developed in the Golden Age have all now been developed, and microbes have now developed resistance to them. So the corporations say, well, uh, Maybe we can't find anything new because we've discovered everything. We'll see. Just want to show you a story now from um, someone in the current um, situation of antimicrobial resistance, one of their stories. It's only a couple of minutes long. So this is the mother of baby Thomas. My baby is an angel. Thomas was born on the 8th of December and he hardly ever cries. He always has a smile on his face and he's curious about everything. He loves the world. And when he was 11 months, he started sleeping a bit more than usual. He started having trouble feeding, like he had no appetite, he cried all the time and his breathing started to sound quite laboured. He quickly started coughing as well. He had a, f a fever and I was scared. My husband and I took him to the hospital and he was immediately put on IV antibiotics and given oxygen. Seeing him there, looking so helpless, hooked up on all those tubes, it was heartbreaking thinking of it now. No mother should have to go through that. 
so they did lots of tests and um, they told us that he had bacterial pneumonia and we waited for the antibiotics to work their magic but they never did my baby had an infection that was resistant to the drugs that the doctor needed the doctors needed to save his life and he became septic the infection was spreading through the rest of his body and he had to be transferred to an intensive care unit and they tried everything they tried new combinations of antibiotics blood transfusions you name it they did everything they could and finally the last round of antibiotics they tried started to show signs of helping and my baby boy was getting better Thomas was discharged from the hospital three weeks after he was admitted and he's been able to lead a normal childhood now and it's like the pneumonia never happened but every day I'm very grateful that he is still in our lives and we got to keep our baby boy. But as we left the hospital that day I couldn't help but think of all those poor mothers and fathers who weren't and won't be and as lucky as we have been. So. That was a wake-up call to the importance of antibiotics and the importance of preserving them. So from now on, I will always make sure that I only use antibiotics where absolute, absolutely necessary. And um, I follow the prescription to the letter and always finish the course. We need to make sure that these life-saving drugs can continue to save lives. Okay, so we uh, returned to those statistics where not everyone is lucky uh, as Thomas, uh, baby Thomas. And well, where do we go from here in terms of identifying new antimicrobial agents? Surely it's not all over and there aren't other ways that we can overcome the AMR crisis. So what I thought I would do is run through some of the promising avenues that some people are taking. There's a huge number and I can't possibly hope to cover them all, but I'm going to try and cover some uh, that are uh, both interesting and that are showing promise. Uh, which we, you know, which is hoped that pharmaceutical companies will pick up and develop so, um, strategy one, we live now in a biotechnology era. Uh, genomics has um, contributed to that. And uh, in the genomics era, we've, well, we've sequenced uh, so many microbial genomes, including pathogens, of course, they're top priority in the hope of identifying some genes that are unique to the bacterium and are not found in humans and that can be made what we call druggable uh, because they are genes that are specific to those bacteria. Uh, this has not resulted in an, uh, an antibiotic which has been developed for mass usage so this has not uh, proven a great avenue so far anyway. Um, Similarly, reverse genomics, small molecule libraries being synthesized um, and tested against human-based cells and microbial-based cells to see which in inhibits is another approach and is widely being used by some clever chemists that produce different molecule combinations. Not yet has that uh, developed into a new class of antibiotics, but it's being pursued. And these transcriptomics, proteomics, lipidomics types technologies are uh, uh, useful in an accessory capacity, but they're not, at the moment, no one can see a way that they can be applied exclusively for antibiotic discovery. So, so far, um, uh, this is uh, not an avenue which is yielding anything. Um, <clears throat> that's not to say there aren't some really nice experiments showing inhibition by some very nice chemical entities. Uh, and the pharmaceutical companies point to that uh, in general, that the um, 
the biotechnology era isn't yielding any new antibiotics. They point to the 30-year gap that we've had the biotechnology revolution and say, well, that doesn't work, so we're not going to get involved. But uh, it's a case of whether they take up some of these promising small molecules. There is that argument. So that's one way. Another way is something called combination therapies. So instead of using one antibiotic to kill a bacterium, you use two or more. Uh, and some of these combinations have synergistic effects. So the effect of the combination is greater than the sum of its parts, its individual antibiotics, for unknown reasons, perhaps. And there are three ways that that can be pursued. So, <coughs> uh, <coughs> so in the case of TB, for example, there are four recognized antibiotics that are prescribed at the same time to cure TB. And each one of these targets a different target in the TB bacterium. So it gets zapped in four different functions within those cells. The other approach is to use multiple antibiotics to hit the same pathway in a bacterium. So the example here would be folic acid synthesis. Bacteria make their own folic acid. We don't. We have to take it up in our diet. But the, the pathway, the unusual pathway they use, can be inhibited by sulfonamides that were discovered in the 1930s, actually, that hit this part of the pathway, and trimethoprim, which was discovered later, which inhibits another part of the pathway. Individually, these are not 100% killers. They are called bacteriostatic agents. They don't kill the bacteria. But when they're used in combination, they are considered effectively to be lethal, bactericidal, together. And finally, another way uh, of using combination therapies is to use one molecule which inhibits the bacteria. Vancomycin is one of our last line antibiotics that's used when all other antibiotics don't work. It's used in reserve, so it's a precious last-line antibiotic. And um, vancomycin-sensitive bugs are destroyed because the antibiotic binds to the cell wall of the bacterium at this position here called diala-diala in the cell wall, dialamine-dialamine. It binds there and cell wall synthesis can't happen and the cells die. But because now we're seeing resistance even to vancomycin, there has to be an answer to that. And recently, some research showed that if you alter the vancomycin structure and stick a chlorobiphenyl group on it, what happens then is that you can treat vancomycin-resistant bugs now because this molecule no longer binds to the diala diala and kill the cell wall biosynthesis here. It kills it somewhere else. It's acquired a new site of action at transglycosylase, which is what strings the sugars together in the cell wall. So it's actually adap an adapted vancomycin, which will kill vancomycin-resistant bacteria when this site has been overcome by vancomycin resistance. Okay, some of my own research revolves around combination therapies too. And instead of, uh, a, uh, so similar to the last example, uh, we would advocate vancomycin to be used to kill vancomycin sensitive bacteria in a population. But we're looking for a new drug which will inhibit the vancomycin-resistant ones as well in a combination therapy. And we are looking for a new drug which binds to something called the VAN-SR system. And if we look at the VAN-SR system, this is the system in the bacterium which activates the resistance mechanism in the first place. So we want to target the resistance mechanism 
um, so that it never gets going in the first place. Resistance can't be generated by blocking something in this pathway which is responsible for vancomycin resistance. In this case, the production of something called Dialadilac, which is what the bacterium does to become resistant to this vancomycin binding here. Instead of Dialadiala, it's now Dialadilac and vancomycin, vancomycin can't bind. So we've concentrated on this part of the pathway, VAN-S, which is a receptor for something which then activates vancomycin resistance. And our first goal was to try and find out what this signal is that activates vancomycin resistance in the first place. And we did this using um, analytical ultracentrifugation methods, hydrodynamic studies, to see whether vancomycin itself was the signal for activating uh, resistance. So the black peak shows the characteristics of the protein without anything added. And the red one is this same protein with vancomycin added. And you can see that the peaks shift and you acquire additional uh, S value peaks here along here. And that data shows that vancomycin interacts with this protein, VAN-S, that we're concentrating on and raises the suggestion that vancomycin might be the signal that actually activates that resistance mechanism. And we did some more analytical ultracentrifugation, sedimentation equilibrium, to look at what happens to the shape of the molecule, VAN-S, this is the protein, the receptor, when you add vancomycin to it. Clearly it interacts, as shown here. What happens to it? So it changes from a nice long shape to rather a compact shape when you add vancomycin. So now we know that's what's happening we can design drugs which disrupt that process of shape confirmation. And that is what our research is focusing on, preventing that event happening uh, in this pathway. And in doing so, preventing vancomycin binding to the receptor. That is the plan uh, underway. So that is combination therapies. What else? So um, a rather successful strategy that's emerging now for several reasons is to harness bacterial viruses. So just like we get viruses, bacteria are susceptible to viruses as well. And often the result of viral attack on a bacterium is cell lysis of the bacterium they die and the virus lives on. So this could be a good strategy. Now um, this strategy uh, has been used for years since the 1930s in Russia and some other countries, Eastern Bloc countries. So they would routinely swab down their operating theatres with these bacterial viruses called bacteriophages. They would squirt it all over their surgical instruments. And for many years, as up to the 1990s, perhaps to year 2000, in Western countries, this sort of approach was very frowned on as an approach to go forward with um, sterilizing and killing bacteria. It was very poo-pooed by the pharmaceutical companies and academics. But it, but it works and they use it today. It's still used to sterilize theaters, surgical theaters. But now uh, the Western, some, uh, some areas of the Western world have come much more round to this sort of idea that viruses could be an answer <coughs> to our antimicrobial problem. And uh, recently there was um, a paper published in Nature Medicine where instead of swabbing down an operating theatre, they wanted to know if phages could be effective in a person and actually deliver them from an antimicrobial resistant infection. And uh, they uh, succeeded in this using engineered bacterial viruses. So what they did was 
they had a cystic fibrosis patient who for eight years, so this person was only 15 years old when this happened, but for eight years of her life she'd been on a severe antibiotic therapy to keep suppressed the bacteria that were attacking her. And eventually she had to have a double lung <coughs> transplant. So when they did that, um, when they uh, did the lung transplant, they elevated the antibiotics they needed to keep everything infection free. But she had a bad reaction to the antibiotics and they had to terminate the antibio antibiotic therapy altogether. And within a week, a, a, a serious infection by a bacterium related to TB actually, abscessus, uh, took over. The antibiotics were always keeping it at bay for eight years, but with the, with the removal of the antibiotics after the theater, um, at the, um, the operation, this bacterium re-established itself vigorously. Now they knew this was going to happen, of course, uh, when they did the transplant, and beforehand they prepared a way around this using phages, which are bacterial viruses. They used a cocktail of three phages to attack this particular organism and this particular strain in particular. It's almost a personalized medicine against individual bacteria. And what they did was they knew that um, they've got a collection of anti-mycobacterial phages in general, but not specific to this one. So they tailored and engineered three of them so that they were extremely potent for this particular um, strain of the bacterium. So this one was a, a, a great efficient lytic phage in its own right towards this GD01 strain. They then engineered by removing a repressor gene in this one to make it from partly lytic to fully lytic. And finally, another third phage where they mutated something called portal gene 3, which shifted the host range of the phage and made GD1 fall into its host range. Uh, and so all three phages were potently lytic. So they gave her a combination of all three to try and keep this bug at bay. And the experiment, as you can see on the left, uh, was a success story. Um, so they tested her afterwards. Um, well, you can see the symptoms. This is what started happening when the infection took over. And after the treatment with the phages, this is the surgical site here where the organism was particularly strongly congregating but she had all these lesions that repaired as a result of the phage um, treatment. Um, at least the serum and sputum samples all became clear for the mycobacterium abscessus. Um, some of the deep-rooted areas, that there were still, I think, they didn't say so, but there were probably still some of the bacterium, but the bacterium is now under control. So it became negative and obviously these wounds look a lot better now, and uh, they did demonstrate that the phage actually replicated. Now you could argue that this is one example and maybe she got better by herself and it was nothing to do with the phages, but clearly given the state of this person even before she had the operation, she was severely poorly and, and recovered. And um, it is very, you know, it is likely and concluded that it's the phages that did the trick there and uh, she survived. So what else for engineered phages? Uh, well, we can, uh, there is some work which has used them as guided missiles, RNA guided nucleases. So many of the students in the audience will be familiar with the gene editing system called CRISPR-Cas9. This is a different shape phage. The phage will attach to the bacterial cell, inject its genome into the bacterial cell, and this virus has been engineered to have three components, uh, one of which is the crRNA, which is programmed to recognize the antibiotic resistance genes that the bacterium's carrying, in this case, to penicillin, beta-lactam type antibiotics. <laughs> and what happens 
is that together with these components, it produces an RNA which targets an endonuclease to wherever those resistance genes reside in the bacterium. Could be on a plasmid, could be on the chromosome. Doesn't matter, the endonuclease will make double-stranded cuts and that means that's a dead bacterium. A cutting of the chromosome and the uh, that's the end of the plasmid if it's a plasmid-borne uh, antibiotic resistance. The plasmid will be degraded or the chromosome cannot, be, cannot get over a double-stranded cut and the cell dies. So that is also uh, a fairly recent um, way of harnessing um, our bacterial virus libraries to solving AMR. Okay, so, so what else? Some people are looking uh, towards methods that have been used before, so they are moving back towards the way Alexander Fleming discovered Penicillium notatum. They are looking for natural products in the natural environment that produce antimicrobial substances that can be converted into antibiotics. So often these exist because microbes in the environment produce antibiotics quite naturally in order to protect themselves in their environment. So they protect their habitat from invasion from competing microorganisms. So for example, there are some scientists who are plundering the seas, looking at things like marine sponges, which act as a home for some unusual bacteria. This is an unusual genus that lives within the sponge and it protects its environment in the sponge by producing a cocktail of 10 different antibiotics. And um, this is now being harnessed to see if these can be used clinically. What other natural products are being looked at? Well, there is an amazing symbiosis which occurs in nature. It's thought to have started 50 million years ago in the Amazon basin and it exists between a group of um, ants, including the leaf cutters, the fungus that they uh, eat and which the ants cultivate in these special gardens so they've got a supply of food, and a third organism, an actinomycete bacterium. The actinomycete Actinomycetes are famous for producing antibiotics. So between the three of them, the fungus, the ant survives by feeding on the fungus and the actinomycete is contributing by protecting this fungus from invasion by unwanted fungi. And the way it does this is by producing, again, a cocktail of antibiotics to protect the fungal gardens. The actinomycete also gets something out of this symbiosis in that it gets a home. So in the case of this ant, the white coating is due to this actinomycete, which uh, is embedded on the skin of the ant. And in some species, this looks really pretty and ornate. The white, again, is the actinomycete on the skin. Or in this species, you see the little white dots actually act as houses for the actinomycete on the surface of the ant. So this is a beneficial symbiosis involving an actinomycete bacterium producing antibiotics. And in this particular case, we've got 16 different polyketide type antibiotics um, produced. Uh, in, in an African ant, which is related to those from the Amazon. So another example, the cotton leafworm has a gut which contains a particular bacterium, Enterococcus, Enterococcus muntii, which lives amongst other Enterococci, but this is a gut organism, but this particular species produces an antimicrobial peptide called muntusin. And again, it's thought to produce this peptide to protect it and to enable it to outcompete other enterococci that are present within the gut. So again, this can potentially be exploited 
as a potential antibiotic. What else in natural products will rain forest frogs? Um, it has been noticed by scientists that these rainforest frogs, um, their skin is very resilient to bacterial and viral infections. So people have investigated what it is that imparts that antimicrobial activity and identified 14 antiviral and antibacterial peptides that the frog produces. And some of these are now being tested against HIV. And my final example is that of the Komodo dragons. So Komodo dragons, it has been noted, um, have a cocktail of fairly lethal bacteria present in their mouths. So when they bite their prey, the prey is subject to infections uh, caused by these nasty bacteria. But it was noted that when Komodo dragons fight and they bite each other, no such infections result. In other words, Komodo dragons are resistant to their own bite from these lethal bacteria. And it's found that the reason that is so is that in their bloodstream, they carry a, a little peptide, which has been called by the scientists Dragon 1, which helps, uh, it aids in wound healing, so the Komodo dragon is unaffected by the bites. So scientists have isolated Dragon 1, characterized it and produced a synthetic version and even gone further by um, adapting this Dragon 1 so that it is, is something of a, a biofilm busting uh, antibiotic as well. Biofilms, very important in hospital acquired infections. These are layers of bacteria that accumulate on tissues, organs in patients, and they're very difficult to remove. So a biofilm buster is um, an, an excellent step forward. So there are um, steps being taken to identify novel, new, innovative, new antibiotics for the future, which if that could fill the discovery void that we talked about um, in the future. It's uh, really a case of persuading agencies, governments and so on to enable pharmaceutical companies to take part in developing these innovative ideas from nature and other areas uh, to bring them on uh, to um, clinical um, development for use in the clinic just as penicillin was all those years ago and recently we organised a meeting under the umbrella of the Royal Society of Chemistry to bring together scientists that would look at these novel strategies for combating the AMR problem. And amongst those speakers, uh, just in December last year, um, Professor Sir Anthony Coates was there and he made this plea and recognised that, that scientists and pharma companies have to collaborate more closely and government agencies do something to enable pharma to, to make it worth their while to actually develop some of these innovative novel ideas so that we fill the discovery void and we don't go back to the 19th century uh, remedies that were on offer then. So I'll stop there and thanks very much for listening. Okay.